are smaller wines. I mean, they, they're simpler wines, the uh, Sangiovese Merlot blend. Um, but uh, when it comes to the other the Sagrantino Merlot, uh, uh, Sangiovese, but the, the, three, the, the three last wines are famed for super longevity. So 20 years kind of longevity. Many people, would, many people would tell you that this is, uh, this is the, uh, the Umbrian version of what we would look at uh, as Grange in terms of longevity of storage. By the way, I love that, um, that Benfold tasting that, that you did. Uh, I remember that very well. That was actually the first one I think I ever did, so straight away. Went from the I've been chasing them to uh, do the new release stuff. They're so bloody disorganized with the China. I think the China ban is putting all the allocations into a state of flux, allocations and pricing. So they, there's a ban on wine to China? Yeah, China's uh, closed. In fact, even wines that arrived on the dock uh, at the time of the ban are just sitting there cooking, Mike. It's, it's crazy. Oh, no, they're not even in refrigerated at warehouses yeah and 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 china is notoriously bad for uh sub cold cold supply solutions for wine so um the stories that i've heard of whole containers of wine uh just percolating on the dock somewhere uh, but they went they would have gone up in refrigerated containers or or bottom well, of the ship containers it depends depends who's the counterparty i mean i remember once uh, doing a big deal for a, a, a high-end brand, and um, the counterparty was responsible for the shipping. Mm. So the paperwork came through, and I said, "Listen, this is uh, not a reefer container. This is a dry goods container. It's going to take from your part of the world to Hong Kong is going to take five weeks. Can you imagine what's going to happen?" She said, "No, no." And I said, "No, please. It's only going to cost. I can't remember, but I think it was about eight hundred US dollars for the reefer container." And she said, no, no, it's fine. Just send. <laughs> oh, my God. They that obviously was, that, <laughs> yeah, that was, you know, I learned a lesson that day. I was, I was. Well, I, guess, I mean, it also depends because if they get it in the bottom of the ship, because you can actually buy the position. So I guess yeah. if you're in the bottom of the ship and you're not coming from a. Oh, oh, oh dear. Man, what's happened? Naughty dog. Oh, he's in trouble, is he? Hey, yeah, Robert. Robert. Yeah. Uh, you, you remember last time you were in my house, you, uh, either you or your, you, your buddy brought this, um, this Cava, this 2012 Cava. That was amazing. Did you guys manage to buy more? Or did you, you, you guys said that you oh, were trying to buy more. No, let me make a note of that because I actually want some more for myself. Um, I'll get onto the wholesaler. Yeah, it, it, it is available. I can't remember the name of it now, but Anthony might remember. Uh, I, I know they sell it at Gag in the city, so I just need to chase it up. I'll let you know, mate. Gag sells it for uh about 90 bucks which means yeah. that the wine the carver should be about 45 or something retail that's probably what it should cost but let me check i'll let you know and yeah, that's, without question, that's the best carver i've ever had in my life yeah yeah i agree and uh, how's anthony have you caught up with him since is he doing well um he's okay i mean i think he's also his business is crazy busy i mean they seem to be just growing and he's hiring people every five minutes and whatever so i actually haven't seen him for a couple of weeks but i think i think all good i think he's i think he's doing okay you know this time of year i suppose everybody's locked and loaded and he's got a lot of staff that have arrived from europe and are in quarantine scattered all over singapore <laughs> <laughs> He's having a hard time babysitting them through their quarantine. You, you should make an uh, arrangement. All your staff that gets locked in quarantine, uh, Wine Exchange Asia will deliver you uh, wine in your hotel. Yes. Well, Jan, yeah. I do quite a lot of that already. It's quite interesting. There must be, um, in the last two weeks, must have been 30 deliveries like that, at least, to quarantine. Wow. Yeah. Um, the tasting should be great. You know, they're desperate for company. And oh, yeah. <laughs> Keep me in for an hour. <laughs> Well, we can do that not back from the fine wine club. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one guy said to me, uh, he came in from uh, New York, I think, and um, uh, via the other way, I think. Uh, sorry, someone doesn't have the Zoom link. Um, 
Because was that a, a friend who was in the Aussie quarantine? She would. She was only allowed one bottle a day. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, they were, they were absolutely restricted it. Yeah. So and you oh, had to order from. You couldn't take alcohol from outside. You had to order from the hotel, and they'd only let you do a bottle a day. Yeah. That's She's quite. <laughs> it was quite restrictive. There was a bottle of gin every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think that's what I would get. I think I would get a bit like I would just drink it. Yeah. Uh, and she had it lucky because she had a. They had a um a recreation area and they were given like an hour a day or an hour two three times a day to walk around the compound. Well, and in the, the vineyard place. around the prison yard. <laughs> around the prison yard. Yeah, it was quite. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's lost. Give me a second. I have to email them. Okay. Uh, Look good there, Arson. Did you guys get an access to this thing the day before yesterday? When did you get it? Uh, I got it only today. Oh, really? Um, that explains it. It's sitting in my junk out my <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's gone out now. <laughs> uh, let me just tell it. Uh, technology never ends. Because your mic, by the way, is not as crisp as I would expect it to be. You've got quite a flashy <laughs> headset. Of it. Yeah, it's, it, we were commenting that on the last time. You're going to give them the feedback, yeah? It's, I mean, it's okay. We can understand, but it was interesting that other people definitely had uh, a clearer. I, I think voice. today is better than last time. Yeah. It's better than it's last time. But, but still, before you switched to it, it was actually clearer. Was it really? The reason why I use it is um, the neighbors are getting the shits with my incessant conference calls. <laughs> so at least it, it, it shuts down one side of the thing but also i'm on a quite an old uh mic, an old machine it's about four years old right. so maybe the bluetooth is not uh not the latest yeah yeah i think i might swap it for my my slightly younger machine okay robert for christmas maybe i need to come over and revamp your it thing as a christmas present oh i would one of those youtube of mics yeah my, my, my shit, yeah. I, I've even got one of these, you know, these donut things with the lamps, but I broke it. I'm, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm terrible. <laughs> but yes, I do need better IT. Literally, you know what? The, the, the time to get to swap you over to new system and migrate you is over Christmas uh, when, when, you know, it's a week of like semi downtime, right? Yeah, it would be it would be a good time, but I, you know I, I'm an Apple user and we get attached to our to our hardware. It's uh, like, I, I, don't know. I, I use an Apple iMac and an iPhone. No, no, I know everything about uh, Apple. Matt, you... I've seen your computer. It looks like a, a NASA launch pad on your desk with that that big that big machine you've got there. It's a big. Oh, hey, so you're intimidated, aren't you? I, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh my god! If I had a, a screen that big, I would access to work harder. Exactly. That's the last thing I need. <laughs> <laughs> now my system here is three screens, um, and none of them—they're all the screens are all generic, and then this ancient Apple that powers it all. So definitely, I need to up my game. Oh, Mike is the expert. Uh, he has like four Apple screens, if not more. Mikey knows actually more about Apple screens than I do. So, Mike, <laughs> you, you probably need quite a CPU to drive all those machines, right? I think that's where um, I'm going. Actually, actually, not. No, the CPU these days. I mean, I, my, my machines range from seven-year-old to like one-year-old. I just like a lot of screen real estate. So, uh, oh, okay. so when I'm working, I like to have, and I like to have multiple machines. So, it's it's like if one's sort of bogged down or whatever, you can, you can switch. You can, right. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't necessarily need that much. See, I mean, I mean, gaming, sure, but video and and not yeah, not, I'm, not that. I'm not sure if it's a good or a bad thing, but somehow I managed to avoid the whole gaming thing. I I, I think it's. Uh, <laughs> I've got a friend who's got a a separate bedroom that he's converted into a gaming like a gaming lair. It's ridiculous. All these fancy chairs and aircon <laughs> and. So that you can you can play all weekend and 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 not uh, and, and not get disturbed by the outside. It's it's very serious. 
Vivian hasn't joined us yet. I need to make sure Vivian Chief Kali. Everyone's looking on it. Yeah, she, she's the um, she's the the marketing guru from Capra. Uh, Judy, come here. Sorry, we got we've got cats and dogs fighting here. Okay, well, <laughs> the uh, IT is very component. So. What's that, Scott? IT, technology and IT is very component driven. So all you need is one look, you can have the fastest CPU on the world, but all you need is a sketchy little component somewhere within your Wi-Fi system, whatever, and it just, everything breaks down on you. So, it flows at all. Uh, yeah. so I, I don't know, I don't know what you were talking about there, but I, I sort of picked up on a, a trend, but. I, I was just, I was just saying to the guys that I've got uh, different, I've got three different screens because of, I don't know, like trading and coding and stuff. and. Um, uh, it, it, it's so far my old machine seems to have coped with all of this, but I suspect uh, I could do with a bit of an upgrade on on, on that end of it. I wasn't sure whether the <laughs> CPU can actually drive all this all this lighting, <laughs> all this equipment. I'm sure I'll get a sunburn from it all. If every, if anyone's just joined now, um, make sure you've opened all the all the jars because the Sagrantino needs quite a lot of air to come around. It's evolved quite a bit since I uh, since I saw it earlier. I'm probably going to have to chase up Vivian because time in Italy. Let me see if I can get a mobile. The dog got the foie gras. <laughs> if Vivian doesn't make it in on time, I'm going to kick off for you guys. I actually went and read up some history of the winery. Anyone who knows how little I enjoy history, you'll know how hard I've been working. Ciao, Vivian. Can you hear me, Alex? Yeah, I got you. How are you? <laughs> Very well, thank you. you? Very good, thank you. Ciao, Vivian. Um, ciao. That's Luigi. I think you guys have met before, right? I haven't yeah, met you we, before. We met very briefly. Yes, of course, yes. Yeah. Ciao, come stai? Bene, grazie. That's great. I'm so glad that your English is great, Vivian. We did a tasting in Tuscany two weeks ago. And okay. the one maker knew, and he, the one maker knew no English as well. Well, he decided he, he didn't want to speak any English. So Lou and he had a great, a great tasting in Italian, and we just stuck around and, and, and interpreted the hand signals. Really? Okay. But um, 
<laughs> I have a trick because my mother, she's from England, so that helps. Ah. No, that's interesting. We've got uh, Morganti, um, some a winery in Sicily. Uh, the I think I think she's married to a winemaker, and she grew up in Manchester or Liverpool. And she's got the broadest, broadest northern accent I've ever heard. It's crazy. <laughs> Wandering around Sicily with this lady. It sounds like she's out of Coronation Street. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, okay. so you learned English in, in England, did you? In England, in uh, Gloucester. Oh. oh, okay. Fantastic. Well, it's seven o'clock, so let's kick things off. Uh, Vivian, thanks for joining us uh, today to represent uh, Kaprai. It was uh, very generous of you to uh, let us have some sponsorship on this so we could get a reach to a lot of people. Um, I, I um, have been fascinated and uh, to a certain degree stumped by the uh, kind of the mysterious components of Sagrantino and the history behind Marco's reinvigoration of it. So I, I'm interested to hear you talk a little bit about the winery to kick off with, and then we're going to see, look at the two, Monte Carlo Rossi, and then, and then look at the Sagrantino after that. Okay. So, uh, as you already mentioned, we're famous for Sagrantino, which is an indigenous variety of the Diera Montefalco, and uh, is one of the first DOCG areas in Italy ever. And um, the wine was found in 1971, so it's pretty young considering uh, the amount of wineries we have in the area of Montefalco and Umbra in general. Uh, presently is run by Marco Caprai, who is the, uh, the, the son of the owner, Arnaldo Caprai, because Arnaldo Caprai is his father. So he dedicated the wines to his father. Um, what um, is the main focus of the winery is having a long uh, and outstanding outstand study about Sagrantino um, revival in the sense that uh, at a certain point this uh, variety was abandoned because in the 60s and 70s most of the people Umbrian that had um, countries had fields abandoned the fields and the, uh, and the vineyards and went away from from the country Belgium and Netherlands so um, this variety was recovered from abandoned fields uh, from also churchyards because uh, anciently uh, this variety was offered uh, to pay the Pope when this area uh, used to belong to the church. Um, so Capri started studying uh, the, um, the characteristics of this um, very outstanding variety, um, discovering that has a, an aging and long aging potential, thanks to the um, tannins and the tannins that which is rich in it. Um, so, uh, what happened? Um, firstly, uh, for example, the variety was planted in different several um, train systems. And selecting the different grapes from different train system were vinified and discovered that the best train system is usually uh, the um, cordon spore. Uh, what happened uh, then uh, changed uh, the um, make one making system. So um, increased the aging in barrels and not in big oak barrels but in small casks. Um, then uh, discovered that uh, the, usually the average is between 20 and 26 months of aging and recently um, we started our collaboration since the 2015 vintage with Michel Roland which is our um, external consultant. This collaboration started for a mutual interest um, 
from our side, more on commercial side, because obviously <laughs> yeah. uh, Michel Volant is a star in the winemaking yeah. system, the winemaking uh, stage. And he never worked with an indigenous variety like Sagrantino. So he was curious about the potential that this mm, grape had. Mm. So since uh, vintage 2015, uh, we have this collaboration. In fact, we are going to taste the 2015 of the Monte Valcoroso Reserva. It's going and to be super interesting to see the impact of Roland uh, uh, in the 15 versus the 13, 14. I didn't realize that was his first vintage. Um, very clearly, uh, from a ratings point of view, 2015 is off the charts. Um, and it's going to be super interesting a little bit later to see just how his approach and what he did with the oak uh, has that impact on, on, on the finished product. That's going to be very exciting to, to have a look at. Yes, of course. Um, so, did, for example... Did he make, did he make the Montefalco Rosso as well or just the Sagrantino? No, no, the Montefalco Rosso, Montefalco Reserva, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Uh, he's the consultant for the, the whole range of wines we produce, both reds and whites. Right. Uh, basically, he intervened on the winemaking processes that we um, used to have, uh, approving some and correcting others, um, and on the aging um, on the aging period. And another important introduction that he helped us to to have is it. Um, my French is very bad. Uh, mm -hmm. Vinification integral. Much better so, than mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I studied it for one year, but not not worth it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we uh, sent our uh, colleagues that. Um, deal with the aging stage in, in, in the winery uh, to learn about vinification integral in Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. And uh, we make this vinification, vinification, vinification integral for uh, spinning beauty, which is, uh, um, as you may know, this signature line. And mm. uh, for 25 anni, um, to uh, improve, enhance uh, the um, velvety sensation of the tannins, uh, to improve uh, the um, uh, the aromatic range. Mm. Um, so this is another uh, thing that we implemented with uh, Michel Roland. Uh, Vivian, to get, to get it right, Michel Roland and his team started working on the 2015 vintage. That was the first vintage, yeah? That's it. And they're still there, right? He's still with us. Yeah, because when, when we visited you last was, I think, two years ago. And I was lucky enough, I was lucky enough to catch up with some of his team because they were still on site. And we were, we were having a chat about what their approach is and how different it is to the traditional approach with uh, Sagrantino. And it was interesting. What they were saying is we need to tame tame the tannins. Yeah. Because Sagrantino, of course, is the most tannic grape in the universe. Um, for those who don't know, it is, it's a beast. It can be an absolute beast. But <laughs> what, what Roland and his team was trying to do was not to, not to make the tannins disappear because that obviously yeah. is the backbone of the wine. It's the structure. It's the... It's the essence of the wine, but to make it not as aggressive, uh, but without detracting from the other characteristics of Sagrantino. Now, I haven't tried the 2015 yet, so I'm really excited to see what the difference is in the approach, because I've got to say, Michel Roland's team has been doing some work with San Giovese and with um, Nebbiolo, yeah. and I'm not, absolutely, I'm not absolutely happy with what they've done with Nebbiolo. In all honesty, okay. <laughs> I think once, you, once you took those tannins out of Nebbiolo, it became a different animal. So I'm going to be really curious to see this. It's going to be cool. All right, shall we? Shall we kick off with the first wine then? Let's have a look at the um, the Rosso 15. Uh, we've we've had a lot of success with this. Uh, uh, I think it's big jump jump off point for us is when the Wall Street Journal listed it as one of the top five 
best pizza wines in the world. It was number yeah. three. They got number three. <laughs> number three. <laughs> and whatever one might think about the Wall Street Journal, um, um, it was quite powerful for us. And it's been quite successful ever since. So if I understand it correctly, Vivian, it's mainly Slovenian oak and then some French. So if I'm reading okay. correctly, it's dominant so, Slovenian. Slovenian. Slovenian oak was uh, till um, Michel Roland came. Ah. Uh, because then he, uh, as a, we, it was a while that we were thinking to eliminate the Slovenian oak. Also because those Slovenian oak was um, 20 years old, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, so this has been eliminated. So since the vintage 2015, it's not Slovenian anymore. That is a French oak. So traditional French oak. Um, and and is, then with this one, it's seventy percent Sanjo, right? And then fifteen uh, Sagrantino and fifteen Merlot. Right? That's it, uh, because for the discipl disciplinary, uh, you can add, you, you must add a seventy percent, at least ten percent of Sagrantino, and the rest can be Merlot, um, uh, other um, red uh, variety. Okay. We decided right. to increase. Uh, the uh, quantity of Sagrantino up to 15% and to fix the third quantity, the third grape, sorry, in Merlot, because mm. it's pretty intriguing the balance that builds between the sense of Merlot, the sweetness of Merlot, yeah. and the, the tannins and the bitter aftertaste typical of the tannins of Sagrantino. So yeah, this there's, is, that, it's, it's it's sort of a stringency and the sweetness and the softness. It's kind of bringing all components into one as a result of that blend. It's very clever. Yeah, and this makes the Montefalco Rosso a really approachable wine because mm. uh, as you um, perfectly know, ta um, and um, Lou mentioned, uh, tannins are a really a bit to tame, uh, have a very, very uh, bold character. And um, in, in a wine like Montefalco Rosso, where the aging is not a long aging, mm -hmm. uh, like for example, for 25 anni, Montefalco Rosso Reserva, because it's, it's 12 months, um, you have to build a wine that is approachable, understandable. And this is what we made for Montefalco Rosso. It's um, really interesting for me because in the last couple of vintages, this wine has resonated right across the spectrum of our customers from people who are just beginning to drink wine and people who are looking for something with a bit more character and a bit more purpose um, it seems it seems to be a wine that at a humble price point seems to strike a note with with most people who try it there's a there's a gravitas and a, a sense of purpose about the wine um, as well as an easy approachability straight away which for me is a dodgy salesman makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Um, yeah. And Montefalco Rosso has always had this kind of character. And especially since Michel Volan um, started working with us, uh, the character is even more, um, uh, even more approachable, even more um, uh, soft. Um, so what Roland tried to help us to build is a more international uh, mm -hmm. approach to some wines and to correct, not abandoning uh, the traditional uh, winemaking and the traditional characters that um, characterize other wine, our wines, yeah. uh, but give a, a hint of internationality in the wines. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. All right, let's uh, move on to the Rosso Reserva 15. Mm -hmm. And now we've gone from a 91 rating from James Suckling with the Montefalco Rosso 15. The second wine is the Rosso Reserva 15 uh, mm -hmm. and 94 points from Suckling. Yeah. And now 70% say, oh, it's the same blend again. 70 Sanjo, 50, 50 Sagrantino Merlot. Yeah, it's the same blend as uh, Montefalco Rosso, so exactly the same blend. There's a difference in the selection of the Sangiovese grapes. 
Um, so we select uh, the best fields of the best um, harvest um, mm. of the Sangiovese. And this age is 20 months in, uh, in oak, French oak. Um, the, I always like to point out this characteristic of Montefalco Rostorissa, which is a, a very um, interesting bridge between Montefalco Rosso and Sagrantino. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Because the kind of aging it has and the, 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 the powerful character, uh, which is not overwhelming, but is intriguing, is um, bold, elegant and soft at the same time. Yep. It's an interesting wine to understand, trying to uh, approach the Sagrantino character. Um, this is one of my favorite, absolutely. Yeah, um, so beautifully tonight, it's just glorious. There's a kind of oily glycerin type of texture in the mid palate, which is just so luscious. It really is beautiful. Um, and when I opened it earlier tonight, I was getting lots of uh, wet tobacco, all of those kinds of phenolics. Um, that's sort of not quite as aggressive now. It's just all harmonious for me now. It's really beautiful. And again, at a price point yeah. that's uh, in, even with the Singapore taxes and what have you, this is really delicious, really quite special. Yeah, and uh, it's um, um, even if it's a complex wine, because as you yeah. said, has a it is a multi-layered um, tasting you go through having a glass of Montefalco Rosso mm. is a wine that pairs well with um, very big plates, with very big dishes. Uh, but at the same time, you can taste having a great cheese, for example, uh, with Montefalco Rosso and enjoy it deeply. So it, it's, a, it's a very multi-layered uh wine i like um, it, it's a wine that respects a lot the the big wines that belong to the umbrian tradition mm -hmm. uh and at the same time you have this sangiovese that uh, is so um uh, let's say uh very full of character, round, um, very, very deep. There's a fair amount of ripeness in the fruit, which I suspect is probably coming from the Sangiovese and the Merlot more than the Sagrantino. Would I be right about that? Or? Oh, well, um, one of the characteristics of the Sagrantino, is, despite being a long aging wine, is to keep the fruit very lively in the aging. So I think it's a contribution from the three uh, okay. uh, three uh, grapes. Um, so maybe uh, you get from the Merlot and Sangiovese, uh, the red, um, the red, fruit. red fruits yeah, yeah. and black fruits from the, from the Sagrantino. Sagrantino. Um, we, we will see that mm, this characteristic with the Menticin Granny, for example, from mm. the 13 to the 15, you can still appreciate uh, the freshness of the fruit, mm. which is mm. a, a very intriguing character of the Sagrantino, keeping the fruit even after 20, 25 years. Vivian, in, ter in terms of the ripeness, what, what do you target with your Sagrantino? What Bome do you try and pick at? Sorry, I didn't get. In terms of, I mean, with Sagrantino, my understanding is it must be very ripe, otherwise the, the tannins will uh, just dominate. But what what ripeness do you, at the winery, try and pick at? What sort of bome do you try okay. and get? Um, so Sagrantino is a late variety, um, and usually uh, the harvest period is uh, end of September till mid-October. Uh, the um, the ripeness we look for in the Sagrantino it has to be in balance with a uh, good content of sugars and um, a medium ripeness of the tannins. Otherwise, um, you will get a too um, tired wine. So this is usually 
the period we uh, aim to pick the Sagrantino. So there's, there's not a particular Boma you try and reach? Or just, you just do um, it completely? That is up to uh, the the winemaker according oh. to certain conditions that you get in because uh, usually uh, sorry lately um, the the vintage change a lot between one and another uh, because the weather is is not very constant uh, lately so you get very uh, for example 2017 we had ice in June. Uh, <laughs> that, so that's that, super that hot. Was, was it super hot summer. <laughs> yeah, but uh, a couple of days were mm, terrific. Uh, mm. We had a, very, a, a great 18. Uh, 19 was, uh, was really, really hot. 2020, uh, despite this horrible uh, year in general, we had a very balanced summer. So uh, that changes a lot according to the season. I guess that my takeaway from this reserva is, you know, the Burgundians always bang on about power, a notion of power and weightlessness. And that's what this wine is giving me. You know that there's a fundamental strength in the wine, but it's so nimble. It's really, really delicious. Um, what sort of cellaring time would you give would you give this wine you you mean the celery time yeah you, you, the period of the best yeah. period, yeah. Yeah. period uh this is a uh, along with sagrantino a christmas basically uh christmas um, and wintery wine no i'm uh, talking about uh, how many years would you see this cellaring for at optimum oh sorry um so this has an aging potential up to 10 years. Uh, so this is a vintage 15, I guess, at least three. The, the best tasting period is after, since the vintage, after mm. four, four years to okay. appreciate totally. Uh, mm. But ob obviously is one that has a great evolution in, uh, in the aging period yeah. has a, an aging potential around eight, 10 years okay gotcha all right let's move on to the the, the vertical of the sagrantino um the first thing that i i, I want to say is when i opened the wines earlier today the 14 had so much savory component to it that 13 and 15 didn't have and it seems to have followed through and still resonates with that kind of characteristic but I'm really excited to see what you have to say about the changes in, in the winemaking. So over okay. to you. Uh, so uh, for the vintage Shinkran in particular, we have 13, 14 and 15, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, so uh, 13 was a very hot vintage. Um, so the, the characteristic of the 13 is um, a rush of ripening in August. Um, so very concentrated tannins. Uh, instead, for the 14, we had a uh, more balanced vintage, mm -hmm. so more balanced summer, and this uh, allowed the wine to uh, have a slow maturation, and th this helps not to have too aggressive tannins um, and too concentrated anth anthocyanins. Instead, with the 2015, which was a great vintage, um, we that that is a vintage where we start had uh, started having the contribution of Michel Roland, yeah. um, and the aim was to um, deliver uh, softer tannins. So, despite the, the 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 constant attention we put in uh, um, in the growing side for or the wine uh, in uh, the the wine we started experimenting for example the vinification integral um, um, a soft approach. Uh, to uh, the aging, we raised, for example, 
the aging period, uh, sorry, the maceration period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, the average uh, was around 30, 40, uh, sorry, 25, 30 days of yeah. maceration. We raised up to 40, 45. And now we're experimenting uh, with other vintages, 60, yeah. 90 days. My goodness, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and in the winery for the Sagrantino, we have uh, the um, short vats and large. So we have a um, um, broader brand of content with the skins. So more extraction. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the 60 and 90 days of maceration are absolutely an experiment. So we yeah. What to... happens to the tannins when you do something like that? Surely don't. I mean, Sagrantino is fundamentally a tannic wine. So when you spend 60 and 90 days in, in, in the barrel, doesn't it take the tannins off the charts? Uh, no, the maceration is in um, stainless steel. Oh, okay. So we keep that in stainless steel. Right, and okay. The tannins are of the Sagrantina really, really powerful. So we don't get uh, the too stressed tannins in okay. that period. And then having for the Venticinque Anni, for the Spinning Beauty, for example, new oak, mm. the chains of um, tannins that are built during the aging in wood are very yeah. tough and um, long and um, powerful so um we we see that having a long maceration that doesn't affect the powerful the tannins okay. but you get a softer uh obviously the maceration period has to be then compared to the aging in wood so, gotcha. so it's kind of it, right yeah you have to calibrate um so these presently are experiments 60 90 days uh, but the, the great thing with Sagrantina that is that you never stop studying. You never stop. Uh, it's always a surprise. You always discover something um, new, a new characteristic yeah. that you can explore. Uh, that is a one of the fascinating things about Sagrantino. And the winery has always invested a lot in the research about it's, it's interesting how the 13 and 15 for me in my glass tonight anyway i'm finding um the evolution of the 14 to be more resolved there's less tannic grip in the palate it's more finished and rounded and it's actually presenting as a as an easier drink at this stage whereas the 13 seems to echo the 15 for me in terms of tannin it seems to be similar sort of tannic grip in the palate so by, in terms of drinking these three right now, I'm finding the 14 for me tonight, and I'm, I'm excited to hear what other people think. It's, it's certainly the one that I'm loving the most uh, this evening. Yeah, um, you're right, because the 14, maybe having had the opportunity to have a more balanced period of ripening, the tannins yeah. are less aggressive, less sharp. Mm. Uh, so in the, you, you can appreciate this in the aging. Um, mm. So it's a bit more tamed than the 13, for yeah. example. <laughs> yeah, 13's <laughs> has got its claws out, right? It's uh, yeah. taking prisoners tonight. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. Um, but that is another interesting thing. You never know what to expect for, for, from Sagrantino. Uh, it's always um, a sort of challenge. Yeah, yeah. Hey Robert, Peter here. Yep. I'm really Hi. glad to I'm really glad to finally taste some tannins again. Yeah. <laughs> I, as, as you know, I'm a I'm a great Barolo lover in my cellar. Half of my bottles are Barolo, but these days, yeah. the last last couple, last like, ten ten vintages, whatever, yeah. it's always so smooth right from the start. <laughs> here, the thirteen, and that's why I like the thirteen so much. Finally, yeah. I've got some real power again in my glass. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know. Yeah. I was brought up on Asterix and Oblix in South Africa. And I remember Oblix used to carry this whole boar and he used to roast it. And I was always very jealous. I can imagine eating like a like a boar roasted over the flames with this with this wine. It needs something with a... The, the a boar is perfect. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, Umbrian, a fan of boars and Sagrantino. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
to be the perfect match. <laughs> That's it. You picked it. <laughs> so in terms of steering with the 13, it's obviously got a way to go before it even climbs to cruising altitude. Um, but what's interesting for me, how, how do you think the 15 under um, Michelle's tutelage, will the wine be a different, have a different story to tell over time compared to 13 and 14? What is the impact of this time with the wine done? Yeah, so I believe yes, uh, because uh, having improved um, in terms of aging techniques, Mm -hmm. uh, that helps to uh, give um, a different version of the tannins in the aging um, route. Mm. Um, and th this is quite important because it gives another, uh, another point of view on the Sagrantino stage um, yeah. so that for us is important it, it, a turning point let's say and not in terms of um, from the traditions side from the innovation side yes because we enhance our knowledge about um, Sagrantino and we added new uh, knowledge about um, the characteristics we can get out of the Sagrantino. So uh, I, I believe that uh, this collaboration added very uh, positive aspects on this side. There's a, there's a kind of shimmering silkiness that uh, comes through in the 15 more on the nose than on the palate. There's this promise of something that's quite sleek and profound. And um, I, I guess that's coming from the winemaker's style. Uh, we, would you agree that um, so many winemakers around the world these days are talking about stepping back from the vines, right? Letting the vines do their own thing. Whereas if I'm reading you correctly, what you're suggesting is that it, at Capra, you're actually taking a more positive uh, hands-on approach to creating something different with uh, Roland's influence. Um, so it's um, um, a merging of two um, two approaches, mm -hmm. um, and having studied Sagrantino for for, for, for a long time, um, we uh, tend to adopt the techniques that respect the character of Sagrantino. We don't want to uh, change the nature of Sagrantino but simply take out the best of the, of the characteristic of Sagrantino. Uh, so I, I believe that um, th this is the correct point of view, looking at the contribution of um, Michel Roland is mm. a merging of two approaches that tend in, in, in the same direct direction and you used a very interesting adjective, silky. Mm. That is one of the characteristics we were looking uh, with the contribution of Michel Roland. More silky. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think he's achieved that, Vivian, but it's a more international style and more appeal, but it's still unmistakably Sagrantino. Yeah, um, it can't be anything else. It can't be anything we, else. we don't want to lose that characteristic. Yeah. Very but important. to me, the biggest difference is the phenolics, the, the, the violets yeah. that are coming through on the nose. That's not in the other two. No, not at all. It's it, just it, in a totally different uh, palette. He lifted, of it, he lifted yeah. the phenolics um, yeah. massively. So, mm. cool. cool. Well, the bad news is we've sold out of the 13 and we've got very little of the 14 left. Uh, the good news is I'm sure we'll have the 16 next year from you. So, what does the vintage look for you? Look like for you, Vivian, for 2016? So the 20, we're already out with the Colipiano 2016 mm -hmm. um, and is a very special vintage, not only because we, uh, um, we, um, we're getting better with the contribution uh, that we learned from Michel Roland, but also because the vintage was great. Yeah. Um, and so Umbria, Umbria is in the same sort of quality bracket as we're finding from Tuscany 
in 16? Is it uh, more or less? Yes, but um, we uh, are a bit. Um, we are closed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in our <work. laughs> from yeah. the mountains we get from Tuscany and from yeah. Marche, so is um, comparable, similar, but with uh, some differences. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the twenty sixteen has been pointed out as a great, great vintage. Yeah, you can see it in that uh, in in uh, what's coming behind in terms of that. The Monte Falco Rosso, just the innate quality, uh, mm -hmm. just you know, at the entry level wine is definitely there. So it's it's an amazing lineup of wines where every sing, every single wine has a story to tell. So thank you so very much for spending some time with us today. I appreciate yes, it. Sir. So Vivian, when, when will the um, when will the 2016 Vintage Cinquani be ready for release? It should be ready around spring. Spring. So what is that? So March. Q1. It's Q2. Okay. March. And I reckon, I reckon that what that uh, Reserva 16 is going to be off the charts. It's going to be amazing. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, and we came, we released the 2016 uh, two months ago. Mm -hmm. The Reserva. Okay. Yeah, it, it's absolutely great. Yeah. So are there any questions from the room uh, for you before before we say goodbye? Sorry, Lou, you, you had a question? I was just wondering how the Americans, um, given American palates, right? And so many Italian wineries and wines are now relying on the American markets as their main exports. I can't see Americans drinking this stuff. They just don't get it, right? So, oh, but, they'll, but they'll get the Monte Polco Rosso's though. Like that. Yeah, 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 they'll get that. But the, the Sarantino, the straight Sarantino, I would have thought Americans would just die. Yeah, they eat, need to eat more pochetta, I reckon. Uh, no. so, <laughs> so then, how, what's the reception been like in the American markets for, for these but, styles? Well, uh, our own quarter in the United States, uh, since two years, uh, is buying a lot of Colepiano yep. and Rosso Riserva. It had a great boom on uh, US market. Um, we're selling a lot of those, Montefalco Rosso and Grecante, obviously. But the consciousness about Sagrantino mm -hmm. uh, being wine that needs storytelling uh, is increasing a lot. And this is a very positive aspect. We are a it's delivering a very positive trend from the United States. Yeah, uh, maybe, the... maybe one question, Robert, uh, from, yeah, yeah, since sure. you're asking yeah, yeah. questions yeah. from the audience. I, yeah. I really like the discussion we were having on the American markets. Uh, I think uh, Michel Roland will, will play an important factor there. I think the 15, whether it's the year or whether it's Michel Roland, we'll have to see next year, I guess. Um, but we did, uh, I mean, some of the characteristics, it, as, as Lou was saying, it has clear characteristics of uh, Sagrantino, but 13 and 14 are still, you know, the real classical stuff. And that's why I think America maybe, uh, in, along, along with you, what you were saying, Lou, I think Rolla is a good commercial step for you to, to hit some other markets. But some of the character of the real Sagrantino for me is like, not, not a lot, but, you know, 13 and 14 are this real Sagrantino. Yeah, yeah but it will never stop being the real no, Sagrantino. For sure, for, sure, for sure not, for sure not. We are correcting a few things, uh, gi giving the opportunity to Sagrantino to express um, a, rounder, um, yeah. a rounder character. Well, as long as the Americans don't love it all and the price goes up like it has in, in Barolo, we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, Vivian. I appreciate it. And uh, when the 16 okay. arrives, we'd like to have you back to compare uh, the rest of the range with us. Thank Why you so not? much. Molto grazie. Thank you, everybody. Grazie. Ciao. <laughs> ciao. Ciao, ciao. So fantastic comparing 15 and 14. Yeah, was a just like different game, just a different winemaker. Yeah, it is a different, yeah. How do you feel about, like, I, I know that we we found Roland with, uh, who's the one that we came across in Brunello? Um, I can't remember now. 
you'd remember. We were. There's a Brunello producer that uh, we've come across that has taken Roland on as well. Oh. 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 I can see him, but I can't see his name. No, that wasn't Brunello. That was um, the Biolo. That was Tashina Bruni. Bruni, that's it. Well, the prices have gone up sixfold. <laughs> So it's uh, 300 euros a bottle. Um, well, mate, I think he charges 100,000 euros to look at a crop. I, I'm sure I've read that somewhere. Like, he must have looked at it a few times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's gone from sort of 50 euros a bottle to you know, 300 euros a bottle. Oh, okay. I can't see. I can't. So I've dropped it off their list because... Uh, I don't see the value for our clients. I really don't. Oh, it's insane. So that was just Nebby. Oh, okay. So it was just the Nebby. I remember seeing them and I remember we were tasting at the winery when he announced the shoe drops and he said, okay, yeah. this is what's happening. And you rolled your eyes. I remember. Kashira Bruni with Nebby. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I'm sure that Michelle will um, make it a much more international style. You can see what he's done with his second dinner, right? Mm. Um, but with Nebbiolo, I don't know, man, adding a Frenchman in there, I'm not sure it's going to really do much for that. Well, I reckon a lot of the Italians must have copped some heat with that. They must have, you know, surely France is France and Italy is Italy when it comes to making wine. You don't want to bring a Gaul into the into the family. That must create some problems with the Italians. Oh, nothing that a car bomb won't fix. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the, Italians, the Italians have got great reverence for French uh, winemaking, as long as it doesn't cross the border. Um, well, I tell you what, I think the Italians are giving the French a run for their money with Merlot these days. Oh, they're kicking their ass. Oh, geez. I've, I've, I'm falling in love with what's going on in Italy with Merlot. I really am. Yeah, they're kicking the their price ass. point and the quality, it's just unbeatable. It's a pity tonight we had none of the Grichetto left, none of the white from yes. the price. Because that's such a clever wine, it really is. Do you do you remember looking at the white Sagrantino at the winery? Because uh, I'm, I'm seeing quite a lot being written about it on their site, but I don't think I ever tasted it. No, Never tasted it. Okay, so it's a supposedly experimental, only four or five years in, but I'm suspecting it'll probably give a lot of characteristics of um, white Tempranillo or white mm -hmm. Grenache. Don't know. Okay. The, other thing, the other thing we haven't been able to put our paws on is this Spinning Beauty that these guys make. What is that? Spinning Beauty is a Reserva Sagrantino, which sits above the Vintage Ingrani, which I just started yeah. making under Michelle. Now, I haven't been able to get an allocation at all, not even a single bottle. So what sort of price is that to the market? Oh, oh that double. That's how it But it's okay. sort of... Yeah, it's punching at yeah you know, hundred points from some people and that sort of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, you know, whether it's whether it's just hype because of Michelle or not, I don't know. But um, I'll try and get some next time. But it's yeah, you know, only one barrel made type of thing. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's probably well. It's interesting because when you start looking at two hundred dollar wines, uh, things like it's in the same zone as Castellare or any of those sort of the super Tuscans at that level. It's got to really be delivering some some loving at that point. At well, that's the you know, I'm highly reluctant to bring it on our list unless we've tried it. You know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, there's too many examples of emperor's new clothes out there to to try and yeah, you know, try and do that sort of thing. But I don't know. Sorry. On on a, on, a, on a novice basis, um, bringing it down. So the 13, 14, 15, well, the 13, 14, I was, what's the plasticine on the nose? That's what I get. So, what, so is it te technically, what is that? Where are you getting the plasticine, Scott, on, on the, which of the three? The 13 and the 14 on the nose. Like, it's fine. It's fine. It's just, it was just noticeable on me on, on that. Yeah. I don't, know, I don't know. I, as I said, I'm a novice, so. No, no, not at all. I mean, it's it's interesting to hear that. I think that for me, the thing that bound the 13 and 14 together the most was like a savoury thing, like a grilled pork or something like that, and then maybe quite a lot of leather. Um, 
but um, the, the 15 for me uh, went in a totally different direction with violets. And it was just so, as Lou pointed out, it's just like a completely different design. <laughs> Yeah, but um, God, God, you, you're getting a plasticine nose. I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I can't find that, but it, it might have been plasticine. Maybe from the astringency. It might maybe from the you know that sort of acidy astringency. I got, I got so I got lead pencil of this right at the beginning, and then it mm -hmm. just straight into this plasticine, and it was like, yeah, okay. Um, well, the, the lead pencil thing for sure. That sort yeah. of graphite kind I'm of the graphite, but I'm not getting. Yeah, the... yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's just me, but yeah, so I'm, oh, still get, I'm, I'm getting it on the 14. The 14. Oh, really? And what is that that slightly sweet thing? Is that what you're referring to as plasticine? Like the play Yeah, 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 yes. But a slightly sweet. Oh, okay. All right. Oh. All right. That's, that's, that's where my pal or my nose is obviously very a novice compared to. The hardened campaign. I, I, I reckon your nose could smell coffee from Brazil. <laughs> okay. I would say that uh, from a Sagrantino purist point of view, for me, the winner is the 14 tonight, just in terms of roots and history. And uh, I, I, it's the one really? that, yeah. And when I, when I poured them earlier today, I thought, no, shit, I can't be right. It, it, it can't, but it, it's the same even now after looking at it a second time. I just, I just like it. I like it. Well, the thing about the 14, you got to remember the 14 was one of the coolest years that Italy's had for a decade, right? So it was cloudy. Uh, it never really got that warm. So yeah. it had a long maturation period, really long. Yeah. And it never really got super ripe. So, and that's what Vivian was alluding to. 14 in general across Italy was pretty shitty, apart from Sicily. Okay. Sicily yeah. was fantastic. Um, but in general, Italy just didn't get any sun that year. It was just horrid. Um, so maybe the Sagrantino, because it wasn't as aggressively ripe, maybe this one's just more Yeah, there's a, there's a kind of calmness about it that I really yeah. like. There's something sort of just finished about it. Whereas in all memories, whenever we've been in Italy tasting these things, they six minutes out of the barrel, and, you know, it just rips your palate apart when yeah. it's especially yeah. just released. I mean, even now this 15 is a year behind release. Um, and even with Roland's influence, it's still got its point of view. Oh, definitely Tannic. Yeah, yeah. No mistake here as, <laughs> as an Italian wine. Yeah, yeah. Well, my glass is empty. Uh, guys, thank you all so much for joining us. We're doing Giant Steps with the chief winemaker from Giant Steps next Thursday. You're welcome to join us then. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. So ciao ragazzi. That's all the Italian I've got. That's really, that's really thank good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Robert. You're welcome. See you. That's really terrible. I know. It's awful. I need more. I need more lines. I know. I need more more you lines. Can't have two words in a whole name. <laughs> Seriously, goodbye. <laughs> yeah.